This is a short video about the exponential function. So maybe there are different ways to talk about why the exponential function exists. And um, maybe we just kind of take for granted that this thing even exists at all, or that it has like these nice properties, like it's continuous or it's differentiable or integrable. Um, so this is one way to try to formally um, prove those concepts. And so the main question we'll look at in this video is, is there a function that is its own derivative? And so uh, the result in order to prove that thing in green is what's in yellow here. So here's what we're going to prove in this video. There does exist a function, we'll call it capital E, and its domain is the real numbers, uh, and its range is the real numbers as well, uh, such that uh, E prime is equal to E for every real number X, and also E of zero is equal to one. So like the y-intercept of that function is one. Okay, so what's the proof of this look like? So here's what we're gonna do. We're going to play with the following sequence of functions. So if you're watching this video, I'm assuming that you've watched my videos uh, on sequences of functions. So I'm gonna tell you about this uh, recursive sequence. So how should you read this? I'm telling you that the first function in the sequence, e1, is just the polynomial one plus x, so there's that line. And then what we're gonna do is recursively, we're gonna define e n plus one uh, of x to be one plus the integral from zero to x of e n and that's gonna hold for every single n and every single x and r. Now, this is just how I'm defining a sequence of functions here. If you feel kind of icky or unsure, like, Ugh, what do I do with that? I'm with you. That's not a lot to work with right there. We're gonna get a nicer formula for what this sequence looks like in a little bit. But for now, um, what do I notice about these maybe? Well, each one of these in the sequence is continuous and it's integrable. And then also, if I look at this, I know how to differentiate that, that's not too hard. So the derivative of e n plus one would be, well, that would be zero since it's a constant. And then the fundamental theorem of calculus, the second part, tells me how do I differentiate this integral. It tells me that it should just be the integrand e n evaluated at x here. And that's exactly what I've got right here. So. Uh, I've got this sequence that at least has this behavior. It's got some of the properties that I like. It's continuous, it's integrable. Shoot, it's differentiable also. I probably should have written that down. But then also e n plus one prime is equal to e n at every single x. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take care of what's a better formula for these here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna show by induction that e n is equal to this. Um, and so that's that polynomial there. If that looks familiar to you, that looks a lot like the Maclaurin series for e to the x that you probably saw in a Calculus 2 class. So uh, what we're doing is we're just kind of showing where does that come from and why is it related to e to the x. So let's show that uh, this nice, or maybe it's this mysterious, sorry, mysterious integral formula is equal to uh, this kind of nice polynomial down here. And so induction's fun, so I'm not gonna skip that. Let's do it. So the base case here when n equals one, well, here's your formula here. Uh, and so, yes, that definitely has the form right there when n equals one. So that's pretty cool, and that's all I wrote down. So how's induction go? We're gonna assume that uh, the formula holds for some integer k, for some index it's good. And what we'll try to do is we'll try to show it for k plus one, why should it hold? Well, let's think about what does ek plus one look like? Oh, I see I made a typo. This should be a k right here. We could fix that right now though. Boom, that's a k. iPads are great. And so uh, what do I know then? If that's ek, then what did I assume about ek? Aha, ek has that nice form I like. So what I'm gonna do is just substitute that in to that integral right there. And so what's that look like? Again, pretend that that's a k. You don't see an n there, you see a k. It's a Jedi mind trick. Okay, and so we're gonna do this integral now. Think about how that integral works. You're just integrating that polynomial. This turns into t, this is t squared over two, this is t cubed over three times that. And what I hope that you notice is, in the bottom, that's two factorial, that would be three factorial. And at the very end, this would be t to the k plus one, k plus one comes down, and when I multiply k factorial times k plus one, that's k plus one factorial. And so finally, we're kind of doing that part in our head maybe, I just need to evaluate it all at x. So there, that is there. It was really informative. And uh, at the very end, I'm just combining some of these factorials, like, hey, that's three factorial. So what do we get? I get that ek plus one has that desired form. So by induction, we can say that my sequence of functions maybe has this nicer form. And again, tying that into what I think you've probably seen in a Calc 2 class, if we talked about Maclaurin series. Now, notice that if m is a larger natural number than n, 
Uh, let's look at the difference between two of these functions in my sequence. So em of x minus en of x. Well, think about what that would look like. Em would be this far out, right? I stop at x to the m over m factorial. And uh, en would be this stuff here. What I want you to notice is that, hey, um, en is right here. So if I subtract all that, boom, it's gone now. And so what would this difference be? It's just what you have left over. And so uh, if I simplify all that good stuff, again, watch one more time. See you later. Goodbye when you subtract. And all you have left is this. And so the difference between these two functions in my, uh, these two, yeah, functions in my sequence is just this part here. Now what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to show that uh, for x, you know, small enough, um, that I could go far enough out in the sequence to guarantee that this is always arbitrarily small as well. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to show you that the sequence em of functions satisfies the Cauchy criterion for uniform convergence. So for any a, any a at all, that's positive, if x is a number that's, uh, whose absolute value is uh, less than or equal to a, so remember all this says is that x is in the interval from minus a to a, where that should be closed brackets on both sides. And if I pick indices m larger than n, as long as they're past 2 times a. So this kind of has like that epsilon delta kind of feel where like uh, this thing here, uh, this is telling me about how far out in the sequence I need to go as it relates to this thing that's arbitrary here. That's, that's all I mean by epsilon delta kind of feel. Uh, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to look at this difference now in absolute value. How far apart is em of x uh, from en of x? What I'm going to try to do also is draw you a picture here. What I'm doing is I've, I've plotted some, some functions in my sequence en. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say, okay, given an a, I'm gonna look at this interval from minus a to a. What I'm trying to convince you of is that I can look far enough out of my sequence of functions so that uh, maybe I get to these, this blue one and this green one, maybe, maybe m and n are really, really big, to guarantee that the difference between these two y values here, that this difference is arbitrarily small. And so again, kind of the, the farther I go out, the, uh, this, the closer that the functions in my sequence get to each other, of course, that would mean that, well, the functions in my sequence should converge to some other function. All right, so let's kind of look at the, that's kind of the geometric idea for it again. Again, for any a, I should be able to go far enough out in the sequence of functions em so that this difference is arbitrarily small. In other words, so that this difference here is tiny. All right, so here's what we'll do. We'll plop down our formula that we discovered up here when we did the simplification. Now what we're going to do is a whole bunch of logic. So if uh, absolute value of x is less than a, then I could use, say, like triangle inequality if you want. Uh, this would be less than or equal to me plugging in a for all those x's for sure. Uh, what else am I going to do? I'm going to factor out an a to the m plus 1 out of all of these. And so what would you have left then? Well, of course, you need a parenthesis on that side. Uh, what would you have left? If you factor out um, a to the m plus 1 off of this, you just have 1 over m plus 1 factorial. And so in the next piece, remember this would be like a to the m plus 2. So if you factor out a m plus 1 off of it, you should have an a left over. Just think about those exponent rules. You remember all that good stuff. And just all the last one, you just subtract n plus 1 there. So some more logic that we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this a little bit. What if I factor out an n plus 1 factorial out of each one of these here? So remember what's the assumption? We're assuming that m is larger than n. Therefore, every single one of these has an n plus 1 factorial in it. So I could pull it all out, and that's what I'm going to do here. If you think about what's left, I hope that you see that, well, there's 1 in that denominator. There would just be kind of that front term, n plus 2 left here. And then in the bottom here, when I pull n plus 1 factorial off, I should just have all the terms from m on down to m plus 2, and that's exactly what these are. Now, something else that's kind of cool that you might notice is how many terms are like in each of these denominators here? And notice that the exponent on a here is 1, and there's one term in this denominator. And notice also here that the exponent here is m minus m plus 1, and that's exactly how many terms are right there in that denominator. A little counting exercise. So what's cool then is, well, if m is larger than n, well then these denominators are pretty big. What if I was to replace every single one of those with this smaller thing, n? Well then I would get the following inequality. So if I make these denominators smaller, 
that's what I've done here. Well, if I replace that with n, that's this is a, a bigger fraction now. a over n is a larger fraction than a over n plus 2. And then similarly here, what if I just replaced each one of these with an n? Well, then I've got this many of them, and I've got a over n to that power there. So why is this cool? Why am I doing this? Because now this kind of looks like a geometric series. And what I really want to do is I want to say this stuff is some actual number. I'm going to tell you that in a second. So the other thing that I've done is, remember, n was larger than 2a. If I scroll up a little bit, I've chosen m and n larger than 2 times a. Remember, a was this arbitrary thing I start with, and I'm saying as long as we go far enough out in the sequence so that those indices are past 2a, why is that 2a important? Well, here it is. If n's bigger than 2a, well, then 1 half is bigger than a over 2. So what if I substituted a half in for all of these, so then it legit looks like a geometric series? whose sum that I know. I know a formula for that. that I know that this stuff, as uh, n goes to infinity, that stuff adds up to 2, and it increases towards 2. Therefore, that this is less than uh, this front piece times 2. So just to recap, what just happened? We just showed that the difference between uh, two functions in my sequence, as long as I'm far enough out, is less than this quantity right here. And so as, uh, as, as n goes to infinity, that goes to zero. So again, as I go farther and farther out in the sequence, that shows me there that uh, my functions get close together. So what did that do? Just to remind you, that shows that the sequence of functions en satisfies the Cauchy criterion for uniform conversions on this interval from minus a to a. And so a was arbitrary. It was any arbitrary positive number. Therefore, uh, my sequence of functions should converge for all real numbers, you know, not for, for any real number since a was arbitrary. So my sequence of functions satisfies the Cauchy criteria. Moreover, this sequence of numbers, e n of x, converges. So what we'll do is we'll define the function e to just be the limit of this sequence of functions. And how will I do it? I will say e of x would just be the limit of e n of x for every single x in r. So I've got my hands on what e should be now. So let's talk about what are the properties we should expect e to have. And so well, given any real number, I know that x can fit neatly inside some closed interval from minus a to a. And so what else do I know? I know that en is definitely continuous at x. And so therefore, uh, by the uh, transfer of continuity property, so remember, if you've got uniform convergence, since the ens converge uniformly to e, if the ens are continuous, well, then e has to be continuous at that point as well. So E is continuous at X. And again, that's by the transfer of continuity property of uniform convergence. Uh, moreover, what do we notice? E1 of, e1 of 0 is 1, right? It's just 1 plus 0 if you think about the formula for E1. So that's 1. And En plus 1 of 0 would look like 1 plus this integral from 0 to 0. Well, that just makes that all 0. So you just get 1 again. So what do I know then? I know that the value of the limit function at 0 has to be 1 as well. Again, that's because it's got to be continuous there. And since these guys all have that value. Oh, what else? The last thing that I want to tell you about is let's get into that derivative, right? How do I know that e is its own derivative? So, well, for any positive number a, en converges uniformly to e on this interval from minus a to a. Uh, and then what else do I know? Well, I remember that the derivative of en plus 1 is equal to en for every single x in this interval from minus a to a. Well, that tells me that the sequence of derivatives, which is the same thing as this, if I just copy, or maybe, uh, yeah, copy paste that into there, it converges uniformly. So the sequence of derivatives converges uniformly as well. And remember maybe that that was some extra criteria in order to ensure that uh, if you've got a sequence of functions that converge uniformly and every function in the sequence is differentiable, is the limit function differentiable? Remember, this was the extra criteria that I needed in order to say yes. So the point then is that e, the limit function, also has to be differentiable since each en is differentiable. Now, what is the formula for e prime? What is the derivative of the limit? e prime, well, by definition, it should be the limit of each of these derivatives here. But remember, what is en plus 1 prime? en plus 1 prime is the same thing as en. So it's the same thing as taking the limit of en. And what do we know? How did we define e above here, we said e is the limit of en. So therefore, I get this is just e of x for every real number x. Well, 
that held for every x in this interval from minus a to a. Remember, a was any uh, arbitrary positive number. So in fact, what we've just shown is that this formula holds for all x and r. So therefore, we've got our hands on a function that is its own derivative. And what we'll see in another video is that this is the exponential function that we're used to.